Welcome to the No Name Brand Podcast. My name is Sashka Hanarapal, actress, singer, dancer, turned brand marketing sales and advertising strategist who brands your soul. And each week I bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover your undergod, turn up your leadership notches, challenge the status quo, because you're fast and furious with a powerful message to share with the world. Thank you for taking time out with me today. And without further ado, let's get our creative and wisdom juices below. Welcome, welcome, wonderful souls. It's so good to have you back here today. So I've been thinking of late of a few philosophical things. Now, if you know me, I can get really, really philosophical. And recently I watched an episode of America's Got Talent. And the person auditioning had a really rough life so far. And maybe you know this, maybe you don't. One of my clients is also Ulrika Lawrence, the founder of Do Good Now Global, who empowers young girls and women victimized through sexual exploitation and human trafficking. And I kind of thought about the two things and was wondering about these girls and this person on America's Got Talent and what they've been through, being abducted, abused. And in particular, one of the girls made a comment And they said, after going through a lot of therapy, in their spiritual life, they made a contract to themselves that when they came into this life, that they had chosen their trauma to deal with lessons to go into the next life. And I'm like, what the hell? You did what? And this really hit me. And I don't know if it's wrong. I don't know if it's right, whether it's on a conscious level, a subconscious level, I have no idea. But all I know is this, is that the people, the souls that go through what they're going through, they're heroes of our time. Like I've had a very sheltered, in my eyes, a very sheltered life. And just the trauma and mm, things that souls go through and coming out of that, that gets me every single time, which is why I'm so honored to have our next guest here on the show today. Now he's down to earth, humble, great guy, great message as well. A lot of things that he himself has gone through. And his soul has learned many lessons. And he's here, very, very excited, honored to have him share them with us today. So first, I want to start off by reading a short excerpt about his life. You ready? Here we go. So it was January 1987. I mean, I was in high school then. I just came into high school. Where this eight-year-old was packed into the local swimming pool with his mates and pretty much the entire population of his hometown of Queen Bien. New South Wales. Now these browdy boys, they drew stern looks from the sunbaking teens and parents as they bombed, splashed and shouted. And he will never know what it was about him that drew the attention of a man sitting on a towel, watching the pool intently. It may have been his dark hair and skin. He's of Maltese heritage. It may have been his exceptionally loud floro hang ten board shorts or his master bombing ability. Whatever it was, it prompted the man to follow him to the change rooms at the end of the day, long after people had dried off and dawdled out of the front gate to head to their local takeaways for hot chips. He dropped his towel on the way to the change room, and it was the first time he saw the pedophile. He picked it up and slung it over his shoulder and followed him into the change rooms. He looked like any other middle-aged white man wearing a singlet and shorts, and what followed was a brutal assault that left a young eight-year-old and a very small boy lying on the floor of a shower cubicle, bleeding and crying. Now, people tend to think of sexual abuse as a one-off, a violent event. But for our next guest, this was just the beginning. The episode at the swimming pool was day one of what would become a three-year relationship between an eight-year-old boy and a pedophile in his early 40s, living just streets from each other in the same small town. So now you know why I'm honored to have our next guest on the show, a change maker, turning the ugly into something good and along the way learning what forgiveness and love is. And this is what we're going to be talking about on the show today. Wisdom, love, forgiveness, and a man, a hero. Here he is. Put your hands together and let's welcome the one and only Nathan Spiteri. Hey, Nathan, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. That's quite a, um, an entrance. It's quite an introduction. Thank you. No worries. <laughs> I like to get the story out first so we can actually get to know the person as well. Because otherwise it's like there's nothing against it, but then it's this long, drawn out, repeating yourself. And then you kind of 
you get into the habit of repetition. And I really like to get to know our guests and the listeners as well. So tell us, let's start off slow and easy. Where are you in the world today? I'm in New York today. Oh, how long have you been in New York? I've been in New York for almost 12 years now, so I'm pretty much a local. Okay. So for those that don't know the story, how did you go from New South Wales to New York? What got you to New York? I am, yes, obviously from Queanbeyan, which is just a little town outside of Canberra, which is the capital of Australia. So I grew up in Australia. From there, I moved to Sydney and there I started doing some acting and got into a bit of modeling, done a lot of theater in Australia and Sydney and some feature films, independent stuff. And then from there, my acting teacher said, why don't you go to New York or go to the States and give it a go over there? And I'm like, you know what? I should. I've got nothing keeping me here. I kind of want to leave. I want to get out of here. I've just had too much bad memories in this place. So I left and I had the option of either LA or New York. The better acting schools were in New York. I could only come over here on a student visa. So the better acting schools were in New York. Came to New York to study. And I've kind of been stuck here ever since. I, I've got a green card. I got a green card in the lottery, lucky me. So I got that in 2010 and I've been here ever since. And for those who have been to New York or who haven't been to New York, it's the center of the world. It, it's really an amazing city and I'm lucky and I'm glad to be here. Mm. So you mentioned something before moving from Australia to New York, leaving those bad memories. How did you shake off the bad memories? Because you have shaken off. I mean, you've done. A lot of work, a lot of forgiveness. Share the um, journey with us. Wow. <laughs> I guess the bad memories were all still there when I moved to New York. And it was in New York when I shook off the bad memories. It was in New York when I hit rock bottom. Mm. I hit rock bottom, a lot of drugs, a lot of sex and violence. And from there, asked a friend for help. I finally let it out and spoke to my best friend who was kind of giving up on me because I was just all over the place and a mess. And she said to me, Nathan, I can't do this with you anymore. I can't be your friend because you're so erratic. And one day you're there, the next day you're not there. Again, with the drugs and the violence. And, and she couldn't handle it. And it was February. It was freezing cold here, obviously, because it was winter time. I just had my birthday. I went out with my friends and had a big night. And again, probably drugs and violence. And the next couple of days, I was reaching out to my friend to speak to her. She wouldn't get in contact with me. So that's when I said, listen, I need to speak to you. I need to tell you something. And I remember it like it was yesterday. It happened probably ooh, seven years ago now mm. is when I first came out about this. We went to a cafe in the West Village and we sat in the middle of the cafe in a little table, just the two of us side by side. And I blurted everything out. And I kept this a secret my whole life. I kept it a secret for 25 years about that long anyway and I told her everything told her about being raped and the violence and the sex and shooting up of heroin and smoking crack and just a lot of bad stuff and and we're right in the middle of the cafe right in the middle of the restaurant I just burst out crying and I didn't realize because all these emotions were coming up and once we finished all the tables surrounding us were just watching and and we're all looking and listening and there was a lady actually crying next to us and it was just kind of a really kind of the first step and through that I went to therapy and then group therapy and then through the therapy I started Alcoholics Anonymous, Sex Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous and that's kind of when I started to I guess get rid of these bad memories or the memories are always going to be there but I didn't let them hold me back, I didn't let them rule my life and it was from there that I started moving forward and learning more about myself, learning more about what I did why I did the things I did, learned more about Stockholm Syndrome and the feelings and the love I had towards my abuser. And I guess just through all that stuff now, I've written a screenplay about my life, which is done. It's with, it's with producers now, or reaching out to directors, equity investors, my posts on Instagram and just my message that I'm putting out there and the podcast and the interviews that I'm doing. And, and it happened to me for a reason. And I truly believe this. The reason why it happened to me is to educate the masses, is to share my story. And through everything that I've done, all my work now and all my reaching out to people and healing of people, if I can save one person's life, my job is done. If I can stop them from killing themselves, stop them from abusing another child, stop them from the drugs and the violence and the road I went down, then my, my job is done. And, and what I've learned is I've 
if I can say it, I've, I've helped hundreds. I've had hundreds of people reach out to me telling me that I'm the first person they've ever told, that I'm the first person that they're telling their story to. They haven't told their family, their wife, their husband. I've given them a voice. They're telling me I'm a hero and, and I'm the most courageous person and, and all that type of stuff, which I, hate, which I hate saying. But I've done a lot. I'm just kind of in the beginning of the journey because I just came out about this and I had this big come out late last year. So it's only been about six months old and we've already accomplished so much. So I'm really looking forward to what's to come. I love that. What is the message? So two <coughs> questions I have. So tell us a little bit about Toy Cars. That's your mm-hmm. play. And also, what is the one message that you're wanting to get out there to the people that you want to get the message to? Sure. Toy Cars, it's a movie. It's not a play, it's a movie. Oh. So it's a movie script. The play's in the works actually at the moment. I had a meeting last week. I have another meeting on Friday with a producer about putting it up on stage as well. But initially I wrote the screenplay and I wrote the screenplay because I know it's going to reach a greater audience. Mm. You know, it's going to reach all corners of the world. And, and that's the thing, this, this subject, sexual abuse, it's a global problem. It doesn't discriminate race, religion, color, country. It's all over the world and we hear about it more now just through the Catholic Church and everything that's going on and all these cases. But anyway, so I wrote this, I started writing this screenplay, my script, when I was in therapy. And my therapist would always say, Nathan, just if you can't tell me, write it down, just start writing things down. So I would start writing chapters and paragraphs and, and pages down of all this stuff that's going on. And we'd go into, I'd go into therapy and we'd talk about it. And... He was like, wow, this is an amazing story that you've got here. You know, it's fucking, it's unbelievable. Sorry, I swear a lot, so I apologize. He's like, it's amazing. So just through that and then through my closest friends who were like, Nathan, you need to tell this story because you're going to help so many people. So I started writing this script and it took quite a few years. It did take about four or five years because I would start, then I'd leave it for a few months and go back to it. Just all the rewrites and all the, the drafts and, and giving it to people and then getting notes back. And because it was such a heavy subject and because it was my life, it was tough. So I did have to let it go for a little while and come back to it. So Toy Cars is a guess. It's just a story about my life, about what I went through, who I was and who I am now. And about me trying to connect with people, with my family, with friends and, and trying to be in a relationship and just always being so distant building a wall and not letting people in. And so I've written this script to, like I said before, to educate the masses and to help people and to say, listen, you're not the only one here. You're not the only one who's going through this. And and I guess the message, if there is a message that I can tell people, and, and this is the one thing or one of the major things I learned in therapy and it's written in the screenplay was my therapist. And this is a different therapist. She would always say to me, Nathan, you could go back now at this age and speak to your eight-year-old self, what would you tell him? And I was like, fuck, I don't know. I'm in an R and a, oh, I don't know. And she would kick my ass. She was, she was a tough woman and I loved her for that. And she said, what would you tell yourself? Come on, think about it. And just really, we talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And then it finally, it hit me. It registered with me. And, and the thing that I would, if anything, the thing I would say to myself as an eight-year-old kid is it wasn't your fault. And that was a major thing I learned was that it wasn't my fault. And in my Instagram and on my website, my big thing, my big hashtag, if you can say that, is not my fault. Mm. And once I discovered that, it was such a weight off my shoulders because throughout my life, it was always my fault. I deserved it. I deserved unhappiness. I deserved to fail. I deserved to die. I deserved to have bad things happen to me. And as soon as, you know, I'd get an acting job or a modeling gig or a, any kind of happiness come to me, I would always self-sabotage and I would always make sure that it didn't happen or, or fuck things up. And, and because he instilled into me and through the grooming and the manipulation that it was all my fault, that I deserved this and I deserved to have bad things and I deserved to fail. So I think the biggest thing I've learned and the biggest thing I've spoken to people about other victims is that it wasn't your fault. You're an eight-year-old kid or you're a 10-year-old kid or whatever your circumstances were, there was nothing you could have done. It was going to happen or he could have killed you or whatever the situation was. So for me, learning that it wasn't my fault was one of the biggest things. And that's why now I truly believe that it happened to me for the reason. And the reason was is to now help others and to educate the, educate the world. Mm-hmm. So here's a question. Helping those that have been abused and 
what in your opinion, why is it that, why? I always ask why. I'm one of those people that always, why, why? Why do you believe that there are pedophiles, that they are around? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> no one's ever asked me that question. Why are they pedophiles? Why are they around? I don't know. It's just that it's an illness. It's a chemical imbalance that these people, that these grown adults, male and female, mm. think that it's normal or think that it's okay to have a relationship with a child. Mm. And I think pedophiles are around because for a large percentage of, of pedophiles, it's happened to them. So mm. it's the norm for them. That's all they know. And especially back in my time, I discovered that the guy who abused me, he was abused as well. So for someone like him who is, let's say, I don't know exactly how old he was, but let's say, yes, he was about 40 years old when it happened to him. In the 80s, he was 40. So let's go back to the 50s and 60s when it happened to him. There were absolutely no avenues of help for these people. There was no way of these people getting help or talking about it. It was considered almost normal and you just turn a blind eye to it and you don't even worry about it. Not condemning it, not saying that's it's an excuse, but fuck, why are there pedophile, pedophiles around? It's, I don't know. I think it's because it's a, it's a chain reaction. It just It's a snowball thing. Once it happens to you, then you do it to the next, do it to the next, do it to the next. And what it is is that people aren't getting the help that they need. We are educating the world on this matter so that people still turn a blind eye. They sweep it under the carpet. They don't want to know about it. So they kind of, in that regard, continue to allow it to happen because... The world isn't educating themselves on it. It's still such a taboo matter until literally the last, say, two, three years when it's really been coming to the surface through the Catholic Church and everything that's going on there. So I think the biggest thing that we can do now is have the conversation, is raise a voice and, and talk about this and, and educate parents like we spoke about earlier, educating parents and letting them know that it's okay to talk to their children. If you see your child different he was a bubbly young kid but now he's you know he's an introvert and he just sits in the corner and doesn't want anything to do with anyone ask him why ask him what happened tell him that it's okay to talk about it that it's not their fault that they're not going to get in trouble so i think the most important thing is just through education and talking about this that's the only way we're going to i don't think we're ever going to be able to stop it i truly don't but at least slow it down mm -hmm. and helping victims because Victims who have never gotten help, victims who have never dealt with it, they think it's the norm and, and they think it's what you do and, and not obviously not everyone. So it's, it is, it's a tough, tough situation and, and I don't know, that's a tough question. <laughs> why are there profiles, you know? Why is there cancer? Why mm -hmm. are there murderers? It's just a, I don't know. It's always going to be there. It's and always going to be, yeah. Before it went back from thousands of years ago, it was happening back in the Stone Age or whenever it was. Mm. I was speaking to someone about this because they asked me why I think that there are abusers, sexual abusers, human trafficking and sexual exploitation. And I just thought for myself, I mean, I haven't even come from this, but I just thought, like you were saying, you know, it's a chain reaction. There's a chemical imbalance. And the chemical imbalance is also a metaphysical imbalance in that if it's been done to them, they haven't been loved, they haven't been forgiven, they had to keep quiet. There's this emotional roller coaster that they're going through. And it, whilst I was preparing for the interview, I gathered my three kids yesterday and we were talking about this. And I told them the story. I said, you know, I'm going to be interviewing Nathan today. And this is what he went through. And I want you guys to know that no one's allowed to threaten you with anything because if you've been abused or touched in any way without your permission and someone threatens you to harm me, tell me because I'll be the one harming them. You don't have to worry about me. I need to worry about you. I need to look after you because you're my responsibility. And the kids were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my 14-year-old is like, yeah, but then I'll kill him and turn his arm around. And then I was like, you've been watching too much Fortnite. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's good. But just so they're putting it in the room and everything. And exactly what you said as well, it's not your fault. Whatever it's it is, it's not your fault. It's not, and I actually had, I did an interview last week and he asked me if you could speak to this guy, what would you tell him? Mm. And I said, I'd want to ask him why me yeah. and if it happened to him and just what, what he went through and if he has the support and the family and everything else around. And, and then I said to him, and I said to the interview, I said, and then I'd take a baseball bat and I'd kill him. <laughs> Clearly. Not, not because of what he did to me, 
because I've come to terms with what happened to me. I do it so he couldn't hurt anyone else. Because mm. they say once they do it to one person, they'll always do it and they'll continue to do it. And whether they're in jail or have had their rehab and they come out and I'll just be repeat offenders. So for me, it was always about, yes, he's hurt me and he's, he's done what he's done to me. And I've done a lot of bad things as a result. But now where I am in my life, I wouldn't change a thing because it's brought me to this part. It's brought me here. It's brought me to interview and, and speak with you and, and just... I know there's a lot of good things coming and everything that I'm doing. So I learned this through my therapy one time is that, and I've heard some people just through a lot of the violence and the drugs and everything I've done, hurt a little to save many. Mm. And if you need to do that, if, if, if that's a situation, then so be it. And I believe that. I don't know how you feel about that, but just through my story, and I'm not sure, or for those who don't know, you know, the abuse went on for a few years from eight years old through to about 12 years old. And then from 15 years old, I would go to gay clubs and cruise lounges and, and pick up men and go home with them. And this went on from about 15 years, 15 through to about 30 years old. So I'd pick up men, go home with them, do what I did with them. And then I'd beat them up and bash them and rob them. And, and I was shooting heroin and smoking crack and, and just a lot of sex and a lot of violence and whilst trying to have a relationship with a woman. And he said, do you regret what you've done? And I said, you know what? Yes, I regret what I've done. I regret hurting these people, but I wouldn't change a thing because it has brought me to this situation. If I didn't hit rock bottom, if I didn't do everything I did, I'd be in jail. I'd have AIDS. I'd be in, in a gutter somewhere homeless. I'd be a, a completely different person. But I had to go through what I did to get to where I am now. Mm -hmm. And yes, I hurt a handful of people doing that. But as a result of that, I've saved hundreds of lives and I've saved or I've helped hundreds of people. And hopefully through this movie and, and just through continuing my message and, and continuing on with, with what I'm doing and, and being an advocate, eventually I want to help thousands of people and millions of people and, and really get the message out there and, and just help all people who have been abused. And so that's kind of where I'm at. I've done a lot of terrible things. And I've hurt a lot of people, but it's all of that hurt and all of that hate and all of that anger has brought me to where I am today. Mm. Yeah. And where you are today, Nathan, have you come to the opposite of all the hate and the violence where you've come to forgive yourself and love yourself? I still have my good and bad days. Obviously we all have good and bad days. So I still have my good and bad days, but yeah, I do. I have forgiven myself. And, and that was a big thing in therapy as well, is just learning to forgive myself. Mm -hmm. And if one day I'm ever going to forgive him, I need to forgive myself first. Because yeah. all the anger and hatred I had was towards him, but a lot of it was towards me. And a lot of the hate was towards me because I just hated myself. I lived my life in that you could be a seven foot, 400 pound muscle man and, and you're going to beat me up. So you know what, go for it. Because what you're going to do to me is nothing I've ever experienced in my life. Mm -hmm. So that's why there was a lot of anger and a lot of violence and a lot of that stuff. So just again, through all the therapy and everything that I've been through and a lot of the self-discovery, I have forgiven myself and I have moved forward with my life. And, and because if I didn't, if I didn't forgive myself and if I didn't move forward, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't yeah. be talking to you. I probably would have killed myself or I'd be... God knows where I'd be, but yeah, that was a big step. And, and me learning that it wasn't my fault was a big step of that, was a big, was a big foot forward in discovering who I was and, and just learning about the past and, and forgiving myself. That's a big thing. Forgiveness is a huge, 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 just a journey on its own and Absolutely. loving yourself at the same time as a journey on its own. And the people that have helped you along the way, the therapy, your friends, hat off to them. I mean, it takes a lot of love and it takes a lot of persistence and resilience, especially in the state that you're seeing someone that you love to be in that state and to hold that hand there consistently and go, I've got you until you finally reach out and go, okay, I'm taking it now. Absolutely. I think that's one of the major things is having that support system around you. Because if I did it on my own, I don't know if I would have been able to do it. I told my parents, they come to visit me probably six months after I started therapy. They come to visit me here in New York from Australia. And it was hard at first because I told them and they didn't believe me, but then they, they believed me and they asked me who, what, when, where, the basic questions. And then for my parents, they kind of 
they didn't know how to handle it. So they just kind of put it away for a few months and, and dealt with it on their own. And so we never really spoke about it too often. And then I have a sister and two younger brothers. So I told them and they were very supportive and very, very good. And I've spoken a lot about it with my parents now. And, and they always ask me how I'm doing because, you know, I've dealt with depression my whole life and, and a lot of other stuff. So I have a great support system with my family and my best friends and friends here in Australia or here in New York and, and in, in Australia. So I think that's a major thing is just having that support network around you so that you can, you're not doing it alone because it's a tough, long journey on your own. Yeah. And that's kind of what I've set up with my website. My website went live, I think this week. Oh, Monday. fantastic. And what I've done on that website is as a part of it, say, tell your story or story of survivors. And what I've put on there or what that is, is for people who are, unable to tell their story for people who don't have a support system for people who because of their economic climate because of who they are their family whatever situation they're in if they're unable to to voice their story and tell someone they can write into my website and just tell their story just type it down let it go which is a, such a therapeutic and cathartic thing for these people and it's also and then i will put their story on my website for them to share with the world they can do it anonymously or they can do it with their name and where they're from. And since Monday, I've had three people already write in and leave their story. And I haven't even publicized it yet. So I'm going to go live today and put on Instagram and tell the world, listen, this is live. And for those of you who are unable to tell your story, please just write in and share your story. And it's, you know, we're a community. We're, we're brothers and sisters and we need to support each other and help each other. So yeah. if me doing this is allowing people to finally come out about their story, and tell their story, then all the better for it. And since this article has come out, I've probably had about two to 300 people reach out to me already. I've normally given about three people a week saying, you're the first person I've ever told. I've never told anyone. You've saved my life. You know, all that type of stuff. I've actually had three women from Saudi Arabia or from the Middle East reach out to me and say, you're the first person I've told. I can't tell anyone where I'm from because if I do, I'll get murdered. And they said that they had another lady from wherever they're from go public in the community and she was murdered because of it. So it's a tough thing. And I've helped these ladies get online counseling. So it's, it is a worldwide epidemic. It is a worldwide thing. And I'm just a, a little person and just a small little thing in this world. But if I can make a difference to one or two people, mm. then I know I'm doing the right thing here. Definitely. So Nathan, we're coming to the end and I still have two questions for you. How do you want to change or challenge the world doing what you're doing? By being a voice, by mm. going out there and just telling my story as brutally and as honest as I can because people still, like I said earlier, sweep it under the carpet. They don't want to know about it, especially when it comes to men and masculinity. And so for me, I just want to put my story out there and say, listen, this is how it is. No bullshit, no drama. And my script is very raw and very real. So I want to challenge the world and change the world by saying, listen, we're all in this together. We can all make a difference. We can all change this. It's like the whole Me Too movement and Time's Up. And if we band together, if we start the conversation, if we make some noise about this, people are going to listen. And not just the abusers, but also parents and families, but also the victims. They need to know that they're not alone. They need to know that there are people who support them and love them that there are organizations and avenues they can go down to get the help that they need. So for me, it's just being a voice, mm. raising, just making some noise about this. And I actually, next week, next Friday, I was invited to the 7th Annual Child Abuse Conference of America, which is in Wisconsin. I'm the keynote speaker to that. So that's very exciting. And that's my first big kind of public speaking engagement about this subject. So it's scary, but it's exciting. So again, yeah, it's just about, making noise, raising awareness, being a voice and, and starting a conversation, educating people. I think that's a major thing is educating people. Yeah. Very big thing is educating people and the awareness of everything. Yep. Yeah. If you can fill in the blanks on three of my values and what they mean to you, starting with creativity for you is. Mm. Creativity is life. And, and I think if we create, people are going to listen. Mm. People are going to learn. People are going to watch. If we stay silent, nothing's going to change. So if we create, that's why I've created this website. That's why I've created this script and hopefully a play as well. 
people are going to learn, they're going to come, they're going to watch, they're going to ask questions. And I think that's the the most important thing is having people ask questions as to why and when and how and what can we do. And so I think creativity is just education. Mm, I love that. Wisdom for you is? Wisdom for me, I think it's just being real Mm. and just get over the ego, get over the bullshit. And there's a lot of ego in the world today with social media, which, you know, social media is such a good thing, but social media is such a terrible thing as well. Mm. So I think wisdom is just being wise, being aware, educating yourself, and just keeping your eyes and your ears open and your heart and your soul and taking it all in and learning. True. I like that description. And lastly, passion for you is? Passion is just, oh, Jesus, that's a tough one. (laughs) Passion is just believing in what you believe in, just really going for it, mm. whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in a career, whether it's in a cause, just never giving up, oh, I love following that. that dream, following that passion, whether it is acting, whether it is me raising awareness and, or whatever it is, falling in love, having kids, having a family. I think just passion is just being in it mm. and just giving it a good role and never giving up and then just being alive and being alive to the moment. Oh, that's nice. Being alive to the moment. Oh, I like that. It's like a quote. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Write that one down. Yeah. Being alive to the moment. Passion. Nathan, thank you so much for being with us here today and sharing your wisdom, your creativity and your passion with us, especially delving deep into forgiveness, into love, into educating us and awareness and bringing the message and especially the hashtag not my fault. You can find out more about Nathan at nathanspiteri.com. It's N-A-T-H-A-N-S-P-I-T-E-R-I.com. And you'll find out more about Nathan in the show notes as well. And if you're listening to this and you have a story and you feel you need to share this or get it off your chest or out of your mind and out of your heart to make space for love and forgiveness, then head on over to the website, Story of Survivors. And share your story, whether it's anonymous or with your name, and get in contact as well. And if you're going to be in Wisconsin, don't forget to support Nathan. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And to all the listeners, we'll see each other and hear each other next week. And in the meantime, be fast and furious and be the change that you want to see and be in the world. Love you lots. Bye-bye. Dang, that was just super califragilistic expialidocious. I enjoyed having you on board and please do me and you a favor. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher. Click subscribe and a super bonus. Leave your review and you stand a chance of being announced and advertised on the show. I'm always striving to ensure that your brand is uplifted and empowered. Remember, done is better than perfect. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and send in your feedback too. You're the absolute best. Keep rocking.